All right, I want to talk about spiritual growth this morning. Healthy spiritual growth. Healthy spiritual growth. And uh, the reason why we're in 2 Peter 1 is we get uh, a little bit of a stepping stones of what growth in the Christian life looks like. And I want you to take a look at this. It says here in 2 Peter 1, and beside this, giving all diligence. So this is saying that when, when we think about spiritual growth, we ought to be diligent about growing because it doesn't happen automatically. It's something we have to strive to do to walk in the spirit and be diligent about it. Be thorough, you know, attention to detail, hard working. That's the idea when we get, um, we think of the word diligent, giving all diligence. So this doesn't give you the impression that it's a half-hearted effort, right? It's giving all diligence, add to your faith. So you see how that faith is what, where it starts. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. So when you think about these steps, what is virtue? Virtue is when you start doing things that are good. So notice that once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can start doing good things, even though you may not understand all the reasons why you do it, right? But the Bible's still saying, hey, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, right? So add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge. Now you start learning the Bible, you start learning things, and as you start doing things, you're adding to your faith virtue, you actually learn more. We'll talk about that a bit later. And to knowledge temperance. So what is temperance? Temperance is discipline, isn't it? So it's that consistency of you're doing the right thing, you now know what the right thing to do, and you're disciplined and consistent in doing it. You're not a fly-by-night fly Christian, where you just, like, you know, you spark a bit, and then you go out. No, it's some temperance, some discipline. Add to temperance and to temperance, patience. Now, patience in the King James Bible is not just waiting around, like we think of patience. Patience is the king, in the King James Bible is actually temper, like going through hard times and being consistent going through hard times. So if you think about this, you add to temperance that discipline. Now there's some persecution. Maybe it's not so easy to get to church. Maybe you've got distractions, riches, cares of this life, relationship problems, financial problems, just burdens that you've got. But the Bible's saying, here, no, you still have to be disciplined. You still have to be doing the virtuous things even through hard times in season, out of season, in good times, in bad times. And to patience, godliness, right? So what, what is God, godliness? The opposite of worldliness is when you start cutting the sin out of your life. You know, some people have this idea like, oh, I want to get my life right before I start coming to church. Is that the right order? No, no, you start coming to church, right? And then as you start growing, then you start cutting the sin out of your life, right? So you can see that getting the sin out of your life and becoming a godly person is a lot more difficult, right? And to godliness, brotherly kindness. So this is loving your fellow believers, right? Brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. So charity is the ultimate goal. So what's the difference between brotherly kindness and charity? Well, brotherly kindness is loving your spiritual family, right? Charity is loving those that don't love you. You see? So that's why charity is a higher level of love because charity doesn't expect anything back. Right? So charity is the ultimate goal in this growth. And the Bible says, for if these things be in you and abound. Right? So again, going back to that, giving all diligence. They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's saying, if you add these things to your faith, you're not going to be unfruitful. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. What is that saying here? It's saying that the reason why people don't continue on this path of growth is because it's a lack of love. It's a lack of love for Jesus Christ and a lack of appreciation for what Jesus Christ has done for you. That's why he's saying you're spiritually blind, you can't see afar off, you can't see into eternity, and you've forgotten that you were purged from your sins. And you are taking the fact that you are saved for granted. That's basically what he's talking about. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure now this doesn't mean that when we think of the word sure it's like make sure that you're saved that's not what it's talking about what it's saying is it's making your calling and election sure meaning that you're not going to move that's why it talks about if you do these things you shall never fall right you're not going to fall out of the faith you're not going to get out of church if you add these things to your faith you're, you're making it sure like the bible talks about the wise words in proverbs they're like goads and nails they fasten things down right that's what it's talking about there 
So you can see here, what, one thing I always like to point out here is we talked about these steps of growth. And notice where knowledge is on the steps to this growth. Right? And the reason why I say this is because a lot of new believers, they learn a lot of new things. And then they think they know more than everyone else. And they think that's what makes them spiritual. Right? And they can explain things and they have a lot of knowledge. But notice that knowledge is, very early, is much earlier on in the Christian growth of steps. But then what is at the end? The end, brotherly kindness, charity. Charity is the goal. But how often do people have a lot of knowledge? They share that knowledge without charity. They have a lot of knowledge and then they look down on other people. They start despising other people because they don't have the knowledge that they have. This is why the Bible says that knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifies. So it's not that knowledge is not important. You know, you want both. You want to have the knowledge of the Bible, knowledge of doctrines, knowledge of the truth, but, but don't, don't replace that with spirituality, right? Like it's part of spirituality, but it doesn't mean that you are spiritual. But at the same time, you don't want to just be all love and have no knowledge, right? You don't want to have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So you need all of it. But what I'm saying, what I, the emphasis I'm trying to say here is what happens to every Christian is when they start learning more, they know more than others, they think they're spiritual, right? But what I'm saying is spirit, being spiritual is not just knowing what is right, right? Being spiritual, if you really wanted to hone in on it, this would really sum it up. It's charity, right? Charity is love. You know, and love's not just a feeling, is it? Love is an action. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 22, verse 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So you see there that you can fulfill all of the law just by reaching that charity. But that's why obviously if we were completely charitable, we'd be completely perfect. But this is what we are striving for. 1 Corinthians 13, we'll just read this short chapter, but this really gives us an idea of what charity is in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 13. And though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I have become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. See, and this is like what we ought to think about as well, that you, know, you may have a lot of knowledge in different areas of life. You may have a lot, a lot of knowledge in the Bible. But the Bible says here that if you don't have charity, what is it saying here? Become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. It's just like you... You know, it's, it's like sounds that are just not profitable, right, to anyone, or don't sound good. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So you see how charity is like a multiplier, and you have zero, it multiplies all your efforts, all your work into zero. And that's why, you know, some people, you know, especially new believers, you know, you're so zealous about telling the truth to others, but if you don't have charity, you want to minus out all your work. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have, ch have not charity, profiteth, profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. So here we see that charity is not just feeling good, right? It's having this strong desire. Charity is the things that we do for others. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. That's proud does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh, so it's appropriate. He behaves appropriately. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Right? Not easily offended, if you think about that. If you're charitable, you don't easily get angry, do you? Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. So you see how there are things that are here temporarily, but charity is not here temporarily. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. I believe that's talking about the coming of Jesus. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, 
I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now by the faith, hope, and charity. But look, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Right? So that's what the growth in the Christian life looks like. Right? And that's what you want to be thinking is like, how am I growing in these areas? Am I becoming more charitable or less charitable? But what I want to talk about today, I'm talking about healthy spiritual growth. I want to talk about the factors that go into spiritual growth. And we can really liken it to the physical world, right? What do you need to grow healthy physically? And we can find that spiritual equivalent because it works very similarly. And we understand health in the physical realm, hey, we're going to be healthy in the spiritual realm too. We put these same principles into practice. And the first thing I want to talk about is if we want to grow, obviously we need to eat. We need food. We need sustenance. Right? Now what is the spiritual food? Luke 4, 3. This is Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. It says, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So you're not going to grow spiritually if you're not consuming the word of God. You're not reading the word of God. If you're not reading your Bible, you can't grow spiritually. Just like you can't grow if you're not eating. Eventually, you'll die of starvation. What's well, the same with Christians. Eventually, they die spiritually of salvation. Uh, they, they die spiritually and get out of church you know not they don't lose their salvation pardon me i'm saying they, they eventually die of starvation spiritually in the sense that they their faith is dead right and they don't grow anymore right their faith is not profitable to anyone else like we see in james 2. job 23 11 my foot hath held his steps his way have i kept and not declined neither have i gone back from the commandment of his lips i have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So you see the way we should think of God's word, we should desire God's word even more than physical food. This is what Job is saying. 1 Peter 2, verse 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So notice there that as we grow in the faith, we need the word of God just as a babe in Christ, you need to get the word of God you start growing and then as you grow you start to get you start to eat more and more you start to learn to feed yourself so think about in the physical realm you know you start off with milk that's the sweet stuff it's easy to chew easy to digest but as you grow physically what do you start to eat things that maybe weren't so pleasant as a kid you're going to eat your vegetables you're going to eat things that are that require chewing on you know and, and you have to eat some meats this is what the bible talks about where are you in the Christian life? You know, you've got to reflect on this as we reflect on our spiritual growth. What I want you to reflect on today is where are you in the Christian life? How are you growing? Are you still a babe in Christ? Whenever you talk about the Bible, you just want the feel-good, sweet, easy-to-digest stuff? Or are you growing a bit? You're starting to learn to feed yourself. You're starting to learn some more deeper doctrines, things that you've got to chew on, things that you've got to figure out things that just, you know, maybe aren't pleasant to hear, you know, but you need them anyway, like your vegetables, you know, they may not be so pleasant, but as you grow and you eat them, you start to like them, you know, you start to realize the benefit that they have to you and you start to desire that sort of food. That's how you know that you're growing up. It's the same in the spiritual life. You know, if, if, you, if there's doctrines that are taught or talked about, you're like, ah, oh, I don't need to know this stuff. You're like a babe. It's like somebody trying to feed you vegetables and you're like, ah, oh, I don't want to, you, you turn your nose up at it. You don't want to be a spiritual baby. You know, we need to grow, we need to learn, and we need to learn to feed ourselves, right? More than our necessary food. So are you reading your Bible? You know, when was the last time you read your Bible? How much Bible did you read when you read? You know, and do you study the Bible? You know, this is, this is eating in the Christian life, right? If church is the only Bible you get in your spiritual diet. I mean, of course you're not going to be growing. Say, I'm not growing spiritually. I want to, like, you know, grow in my spiritual walk, in my relationship with God, growing work. Well, if you're not reading your Bible, of course you're not going to grow. 
right? And if you're only... Now think about if, if the Word of God is like food. I mean, do you eat once a week? You know, you don't even eat once a day. I mean, you eat multiple times a day. That's why the Bible in your heart, and it's with you. You know, you can always eat on God's Word, right? So some... So going to church, it's like going out to eat, isn't it? So think about that food. You know, some churches, unfortunately, are like that dodgy place around the corner that you don't really want to go eat at. And, uh, you know, you, you may learn some, um, some bad things. Um, some churches, you know, they're like a dessert shop. Well, you go there and it's just sweet, easy. But, you know, even the Bible says here in Proverbs 27, look at it, it says here, the full soul loatheth and honeycomb, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. So you can, you can still have too much of a good thing. You know, in any balanced diet, you want vegetables, you want meat, you need a bit of sweets, you need a bit of sugar in your diet. You can't have no sugar in your diet, right? So you need a bit of sugar in your diet. It's the same with church, the same the way you eat, maybe the sermons that you listen to online. But you don't want to have a diet in your spiritual life of just sweets. And the equivalent of sweets, like I said, in the, in the spiritual realm is it's that feel-good message that, you know, just is, is motivational. And like I said, these things are needed every now and then. But if that's all you're getting, right, just the motivational stuff, it just feels good, just a pat on the back all the time, that's not, that's not what you need. Sometimes you need, you know, a bit, of, a bit of a poke with the stick to get you moving, right? So feel-good sermons, they have their place. But you can only grow so much eating desserts only and like this verse says even too much of a good thing right honey you'll still loathe it after a while right matthew 6 look what the bible says here after this manner this is the lord's prayer after this manner therefore pray ye our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth in earth as it is in heaven give us this day look at this our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So notice it says here, give us this day our daily bread. This is why you can't be eating spiritually just once a week. You have to be eating daily, right? Feeding on God's word, understanding God's word, reading God's word. Give us this day our daily bread. Now let me ask you, Right? If you're an adult, every day, you're not being spoon-fed by somebody else, right? That's what it's like in the Christian life, is if you only get your Bible from listening to sermons. Now, some people think, yeah, I do listen to the Bible every day. I listen, put on a YouTube sermon, put on this sermon, I'm listening to sermons every day. Yeah, but guys, you've got to get to the point in the Christian life where you can feed yourself, you know? So you can, you can read the Bible and just read it, understand it, digest on it yourself you and the Holy Spirit, right? That's a measure of your spiritual maturity, right? Because you're not at home eating every day and somebody's just spoon-feeding you, right? You learn to feed yourself. It's the same in the Christian life. The danger always, and it, it always happens as you grow in the faith with new believers, is, you know, of course, it's easier for somebody to else to prepare your message. You learn from church, you learn from sermons. But what I'm trying to tell you here today is you don't want to get to the point where that's all you know. Because that's what happens in the Christian life. You listen to a lot of sermons and you think you know a lot, but you don't. You just know the teachings of all the people you've been listening to. But you've never actually read the Bible yourself, thought about it and thought, are these people actually teaching what the Bible says? Right? And, and that's a very dangerous position to be in. This is why sometimes new believers, they follow one preacher, then they follow another preacher, and then that preacher maybe they don't like it, they follow, they just keep going from one preacher to the next, and that's where they get their truth from. But if you want stability in your Christian life, you need to know the Bible. You need to get to the point where you read it, you're familiar with it. So that way, when you're listening to a sermon, it's not just, oh, that sounds pretty good. No, it's, ah, oh, you know, I know that passage. He is interpreting it right. He is explaining it right. That, this, is a, this is a good preacher because he knows the Bible and that lines up with what the Holy Spirit has taught me when I've read the Bible myself. right? Because, you know what, it's very easy for very eloquent speakers just to make things sound really good. But if you don't know the Bible, you run the risk of being led astray or learning something false. 
Right? It might not even be you know, necessarily heretical or detrimental to you, but it just might be a, a misconception you know, that is just repeated again and again and again. I mean, sometimes I preach sermons where I feel that people have a lot of misconceptions in Christianity, right? But these are promoted and they just are promulgated because people just listen to them and they repeat them and then they don't verify them, right? So give us this day our daily bread. You want to feed, learn how to feed yourself, right? Now, like I said, the ability to feed yourself and the type of food you can eat is a measure of your physical maturity, right? Think about that when it comes to your spiritual maturity as well. You know, what type of things are you able to talk about? When we talk about spiritual things, it's like, what can you talk about? What are the things you can take? And I got this thought as well, like you think about, you know, a child, um, you know, when you feed them different foods that maybe they're not used to. You know, everyone's done the thing where they've given their toddler like their first bite of a lemon, right? It's always really funny. Or, you know, you you give them that first taste of chili. You know, you give them that, you know, that first where you're starting to introduce them to different foods. And think about what babies are. They're like, they're easily offended, aren't they? They eat some chili and then they're like, oh, they're crying and they didn't like it and then they never want to eat it again. Some Christians are like that. Some Christians are like that. They, They can't handle an opposing view. They can't handle discussion. You know, you disagree with them, oh, they're all offended. That's also a measure of your spiritual maturity. How easily offended you are is a measure of your spiritual maturity as well. Because, you know, the more you're used to in terms of spiritual food, right, the more you can take, just like as an adult, right? If you're a picky eater, you know, this is like what children do. But adults, they they, they learn to eat and enjoy different things, right? So how well can you accept new foods? without being offended, right? And then the other thing is you want to get the bad foods out of your diet. So spiritually, what would that be? The bad foods in your diet. It would be teachings that are like self-glorifying or humanistic, you know, telling you, you know, how great you are as opposed to how great God is, right? Telling us, you know, oh, if you just believe in yourself, you know, there's a lot of that out there, right? You go watch all the motivational YouTube videos, you just put your mind to it, you just believe in yourself. You can make it happen. And it's, you know, that's not 100% true, right? Because we have to trust in the Lord. I can do things, all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And the only reason why that we're able to get wealth and get success and work hard is because Jesus gives us these abilities to do so. So we need to acknowledge those things in our life. And that's some, you know, sort of bad foods. Obviously false, negative doctrines, right? We've got to be careful of. Just we've got to be careful of our physical diet. 2 Corinthians 7, look at this. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Right? So it's not just the physical cleanliness that God is concerned about. Like we're talking about spiritual cleanliness. That's why. How do you cleanse yourself of the filthiness of the spirit? Well, that's the teachings, right? That's the things that you learn. The, 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 the um, philosophies that you may take on that shouldn't be taken on. That's that junk food, that bad food, I guess the drugs in your spiritual life, right? Because sometimes false doctrine can be addictive. You know, how many like Christian churches, especially Christian churches that are filled with Asians and things like that, where they already have a mindset of giving for prosperity, right? That's why they want to give money because they're hoping that God will bless their business. They give, the more they give, oh, the more money you're going to make. And, uh, you know, this whole prosperity gospel, right? And they like that, right? And sometimes it's like a drug in their life where they want to believe that because they want to be able to use that to their own benefit as opposed to the glory of God. So food is number one. So some practical tips, right? Make sure you've got a King James Bible. You need to make sure you're reading the right Bible. There's all different Bible versions out there. I'm not talking about why we use the King James Bible today. But I believe you need to get a King James Bible because that's the one that's the most accurate, right? Out of, I think it's the only one that's 100% accurate um, of the English Bibles. A lot of the English Bible translations have problems. So you want to read a little bit each day, right? It's easier to read a little bit each day than it is to just read huge chunks, right? That's why when we talked about spiritual growth, that temperance, that patience, that consistency, that will get you a lot further 
than just trying to do like a lot in one stint and then just like not picking it up for months, right? Just read a little bit every day. Just read it a little bit every day. It's also going to be at the front of your mind. Another thing is you can get an audio Bible. You know, one, day, one, one way you can listen to Bible is you, know, you just download an audio Bible, put it on when you're in the car, you know, rather than just listening to just you know, worldly music all the time, you know, put, put the Bible on and just listen to it. And the more you listen to it, the more familiar you get with it. And then when you read it, it's going to be more familiar to you. See, the only reason why you read the Bible and you say, I have no idea what this is talking about, is because you haven't read it enough. You know, the, Bible, the Bible doesn't change. You know, it's been the same book for hundreds and hundreds of years. You know? So the reason why you're reading it and you're just thinking, I don't get what it's saying, is probably because it's the first or the second time you're reading that passage. Or you just haven't read it enough. The more you read it, the more familiar you get with it, the more it makes sense to you. I still remember the day when I was in youth group because this is back in the day when I had no idea like what the Bible was, right? And I had no idea, you know, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. I had no idea that those were letters to churches, right? Because, you know, I always assumed that the Bible was like the Quran where it's just like this random, just random sayings. And you, you know, you, you think that when you don't know the Bible, you think the Bible is just like the book of Proverbs, but just like all through the Bible. You know what I mean? It's just like, just anywhere in the Bible, it's just like these random verses. Because everyone just quotes these random verses. So you just think like the Bible is just this book of just random sayings and wise sayings. And the book of Proverbs is a bit like that. So I remember sitting in church and we're going through Galatians and then it just dawned on me that, wow, this, this is somebody actually writing a letter to a group of people. And I just, yeah. So my point is that you have those sort of light bulb moments when you're reading through the Bible. The first time you read through it, it doesn't make sense to you. And then you come back to it and you're like, whoa, I actually can understand what's happening here. You know, and then you, it's like I can actually start visualizing what's going on here. And it's not just because it's just some special revelation. It's just because through the diligence of reading the Bible and getting more familiar with it, you, the, the Holy Spirit's starting to reveal more things to you. Right? So don't be discouraged when you read the Bible. Just best way to do it is just read it from front to back. If you're reading, if you're a new believer, just start in the New Testament and just read through it. If you don't understand it, don't get bogged down. Just keep reading through it. Just keep reading through it. Like I said, the Bible doesn't change. Just read it again and again and again, and it'll start to become familiar with you. you you'll get onto it like the fourth, fifth, sixth time, and then you'll be seeing things in the Bible that you didn't see the first time, the second time around, right? But that's one of the best ways, I think, just to read the Bible. I don't think you should just pick and choose books, you know, just randomly here and there, because what ultimately happens is you start read, you start gravitating the books and the verses that you prefer, right? So if you treat the Bible like a smorgasbord, you know, and you're not a very mature person, like the kids, they just run to the dessert bar, right? If you don't tell them, ah, oh, wait, you got to eat this first. So it's the same in the Christian life. So that's why just, just, it's all good. This is not like a smorgasbord where there's good and bad. All of God's word is good. So that's why I read through it and Read it all, right? Rather than just random verses and chapters. And like I said, don't worry if you don't understand anything. So that's talking about food. Okay? Eating in the Christian life. We need to make sure we're getting sustenance. Number two, if we want healthy spiritual growth, because we don't just want spiritual growth, right? We want healthy spiritual growth. And just like you don't want just growth in your physical life, just putting on the kilos, right? You want healthy growth. You know, you want to be a strong person. It's the same in the Christian life. You need to build up your strength as well. And the way you do that, you don't only need food, you need to do work in the Christian life. You will not grow unless you do some spiritual work. Yes, you might grow as a new believer as you take the milk of the word and you're feeding yourself, only feeding once a week, but that growth is going to start plateauing as you start needing to build some strength in order to build up that appetite. Look at what it says here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So the Bible actually exhorts us to be constantly working for the Lord because that's really what our life should be about. And you say like, Victor, but I'm not a, I'm not a bishop. You know, I don't, I don't get up and preach like you do. How am I doing a spiritual work? 
But you know, like going to your job is a spiritual work as well. You know, making sure you work at that job like you're serving Jesus Christ, making sure that you're a good testimony, you know, making sure that the, you treat people with respect, you're loving your neighbor as yourself, that you're trying to be a good influence in that workplace or in your business. I mean, this is spiritual work as well. So we always are bounding in the work of the Lord. And what that means is everything we do has the purpose of glorifying God and of serving God. But do you have that mindset? Do you think, oh, Sunday from 10 to 11.30, that's what I'm focused on the Lord. But that shouldn't be the case. Because how, how whole life should be about being focused on the Lord and doing things for the purpose of Jesus Christ. Now we're talking about healthy spiritual growth. And like I said, in your physical life, you can't just only eat. You've got to do some work. So... Imagine a person that only eats and never does any physical work. I mean, these are the people that put on you know, several hundred kilos, you know, several hundred pounds or whatever. People that are obese. And you know, in the Christian life, some Christians are like that too. Where they eat and they eat, they go to church. They've been going to church for years, multiple times a week. Learning and learning, listening to service, knowing this, knowing that. But they never do any work. And if you were to put on some spiritual glasses, they would be like that obese person that can't get out of their bed spiritually because all they do is eat and they don't do any work. Right? So we don't want to be like that physically. We don't want to be like that spiritually either. Right? So same happens in the spiritual life when a person doesn't do enough work right, to burn off those calories. Right? Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So what is, so in work in the physical world, it might be like physical work, you know, exercise, all that sort of stuff. So what is work in the spiritual realm? What is the work that we are involved in? Well, the work that we're involved in is preaching the gospel, right? That's the main work in the spiritual life. And sometimes Christian churches forget that, where, yes, we have, you know, we can take part in social aspects, right? Where, you know, people do a lot of charity, they do a lot of volunteer work, and all that but the end goal of all that was meant to be to teach people the gospel right to provide an opportunity to preach people the gospel get them baptized and teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you so it's not only preaching just salvation right it's also teaching them how to live by God's word which is what you're sort of sitting under here now this is why one of the purposes of church is to teach believers the word of God so we're not just trying to get unbelievers saved we're trying to teach believers the word of God and turn them into disciples as well. So that is the spiritual work, right, that we are involved in. So you need to ask yourself the question, how am I contributing to that work in the spiritual realm? You know, I mean, first of all, we need to feed ourselves. We need to know the Bible. And second of all, we need to use our knowledge of the Bible to help sort of promulgate Christianity, right? To, to spread Christianity and spread the gospel to others. So where do we play a part in that? That's where we've got to make sure that we're plugged in somewhere. And obviously in this church, you know, for men, they can preach, preach the Bible from here. You know, we've got soul winning where you can go out and preach the gospel to people, teach people the Bible. But then there's also just the ministry of just taking care of one another and talking one another, helping each other grow in your Bible as well and in your Bible knowledge, right? So some, some practical applications. We talked about soul winning, right? To reach people. So see, the good thing about soul winning when you go out and you preach the gospel, one is, you know, one is, is you're growing. The other thing is that you're practicing on people that you don't know, right? So you go out, you learn how to give the gospel. You're hearing it all the time. You're having discussions with people. You're learning with people that you don't know so well. So that when you do have that conversation with the per person you do know, you're way more prepared than if you only just spoke to people that you do know. And you know how it is with people you know? You, you get less opportunities with people that you 
you know, because sometimes you know they may not want to talk about it again and all that sort of stuff. So you want to make sure that if you're seeing these people all the time, that you that you put your best foot forward, right? And you know what you're talking about. And the best way to do that is that you practice on people that you don't know so much, that you don't have so much credibility with. So then when you talk with the people that you do know, you have a, a better chance, a better shot at winning them over. So then you use what you learn to preach the gospel to people that you do know. Um, you know, volunteering in other aspects of the church. I mean, there's plenty of other work to do that, that all goes towards this goal of what the purpose of this church here is, which is to give the gospel and to, and to, um, and to uh, preach the gospel and preach the Bible. Now, let's go to John 15. I think this is a really important point that I want you guys to understand. John 15, it says here, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now notice here, it's not that the branch is purged and then it brings forth fruit. It's every branch that is bringing forth fruit, it is purged, or it's like cleaned up, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now why is this relevant? Because when it comes to spiritual work, how many times do people say, oh, you know, I'm just, you know, I've got to clean up my life first. I've got to get everything in order. I've got to have all my ducks in a row. I've got to make sure I know more before I get involved in the work. Right? So say, for example, soul winning is a good example. They say, oh, you know, I, but I don't know that much. You know, I don't, I don't know everything. Oh, I've got to clean some things up in my life before I really, uh, you know, jump in two feet first. But that's not how it works in the Christian life. In the Christian life, the Bible says the branch that is bearing fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. So don't get this idea that you need to have all your ducks in a row, everything needs to be, you know, all fine and dandy before you jump in and start serving in the Christian life. The way it actually works is, like we talked about in the steps, in the spiritual growth, you add to your faith virtue. You say you start doing things first, and then as you do, you're learning, you grow, you bring forth more fruit, right? So you don't want to have the cart before the horse, right? If you're saved, that's enough to get involved in the work. And as you work, that's how you're going to grow. Because remember, it's not just about eating to grow. You need to eat and work. And then that's where you get healthy spiritual growth, right? So work leads to growth. It's not the other way around. Teaching others, think about it, it reminds you. When you go to work, you grow more. Teaching others, it edifies you, right? Because you're learning, you're growing even more. And then when you teach others, it multiplies you, doesn't it? The more you teach, the more it multiplies. Now, work, if you think about this, right? When you do physical work, you build up an appetite, don't you? So people that sit around all day doing nothing, they don't always build up that appetite. When you go to work, you know, you're thinking really hard, you've, you're laboring. It builds up that appetite, doesn't it? It's the same in the spiritual realm. You know, the reason why you don't have a desire to learn more about the more deep things of Christianity is because you're not putting the knowledge that you do have to work. Because if you did, right, you had a desire to get other people saved, you'd come across questions, you'd go, you know what, I need to find out the answer to that. I want to make sure I, I answer these questions. I want these people to get saved. So I'm just painting you that, that analogy where it's the same in the physical realm where you do more work, you build up more of an appetite. In the spiritual realm, it's the same. So, so I believe that the reason why maybe you don't have that spiritual appetite like you should is because you're not doing enough spiritual work to build up that appetite. Because when you do get involved in the work and you start going out trying to convince people of the gospel, that's what builds a desire to want to learn more. I mean, didn't that happen to you with COVID? You know, trying to convince people about COVID and all the stuff that's going on with COVID. And then you know what? Hey, I'm going to find out that stuff. I'm going to read that study. I'm going to read that journal. I'm going to try and find out to justify, you know, the things that you're trying to teach. It's the same thing in the spiritual world, right? And that's why the more you try and convince others, the more you're going to want to learn, right? And the reason why, unfortunately, you may not have that desire is because you don't have a desire that's strong enough to want to get people saved. 
Because if you did, you'd want to learn, because you'd want to conv convince people, try and answer their questions. Right? So we need to work. It's going to build that desire. And the more you work, the more it reminds you of God's love and how other people need God's love, and then you build that appetite. Right? Now, when you stop working hard, you're going to eat less. Right? You're going to start to lose those gains, like in the physical realm. Right? Let's say you're working hard, you're building up some muscles, but then when you stop, what happens? Then it starts all going to like... You just start getting squishy again, right? And, and you lose all those gains. You lose all that hard work. And unfortunately, it's like that in the spiritual life as well, right? If you stop working, you start going backwards, right? And this is why in the Christian life, there's something called backsliding. James 1 talks about it very well, right? Be, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein. That's doing it. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. See, it is true in the spiritual life that if you don't use it, you lose it. And if you don't use the knowledge that you have, you're going to lose it. You're going to start backsliding in your Christian life. Right, So this is the thing about spiritual growth. See, in the physical realm, it's always forward. Right? We wish that we could reverse it. Right? You get older, you get older, you, there's nothing you can do to stop it. You just keep getting older and older and older. But, but in the spiritual life, that's not the case. Right? In the spiritual life, you're only growing because you're walking in the Spirit. If you stop walking in the Spirit, you start getting younger. Right? <laughs> and that's not what you want in the spiritual life. You don't want to remain a babe in Christ. But that's what will happen if you're not growing, right? Now let's talk about the third factor. We need food, we need to work, but it's going to take time as well. And like we talk, I was just mentioning, in physical life, growth is automatic over time. But in the spiritual life, it's not automatic. But it does take time. But the time that it takes, right, it's not just automatic. The time it's, is measured by how much time you spend in the Spirit. Right? If you're just spending all your time in the flesh, serving yourself, living your own life, then obviously you're going to stay a babe in Christ. So it's about how much time you spend in the spiritual life. Right? And it's not automatic because not everyone is walking in the Spirit. Look at what Jesus says here in Matthew 15, 7. He says, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah, Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So Jesus here is talking about the Pharisees. But we don't want to be like the Pharisees, right? We don't want to have this, which a lot of Christians do. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. What is this talking about? This means that your, act, your, your heart doesn't line up with your actions. You know, and you can easily fall into that trap in Christianity where you're just going through the motions, right? You're, you're going to church because you have to go to church, but do you really want to be at church? Do you want to be at church? Not because, you know, you're pleasing somebody else here at church, or you want to be seen in the eyes of men, but you want to be at church because you know that when you're at church, you're pleasing to God. That God is happy that you're here. That's what motivates me to come to church. And that's what's going to motivate you to go to church in the good times and the bad times. Because, you know, even when you're going through a rough time, you can still please God. God can be happy with you. You can sleep at night having a good conscience before God. So you don't want to be like this. You don't want to be that yeah, you're just in action but your heart is far from him. Now, what's the relevance of this point that I'm making? Is that when we talk about spiritual growth and your time spent walking in the Spirit, it's not just doing Christian things, right? Because like I said, you could do Christian things with the wrong heart, right? Because you're just going through the motions. And then you're not going to grow if your heart's not there, if your heart's not in the right place, 
right? So walking in the Spirit is about having your heart in the right place as well as you do those Christian things. And there's not that many really, you know, you can, you can categorize Christian things into, you know, going to church, obeying the Bible. That's a big category, right? Because that's, that's not an easy thing to do. You know, reading your Bible, preaching the gospel to others, and spending time in prayer. Right? There's really only a few areas of the Christian life. But, you know, they're all very difficult to be diligent about right? and do them consistently. So it's time, but it's time spent in the Spirit, not in the flesh. 1 Corinthians 3, it says here, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. What's the difference there? So that's the Spirit and the flesh. Carnal just means fleshly, right? Even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with me. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Right? So Paul here talking that there were some things that he wanted to teach the Corinthian church, but he didn't think they'd be able to handle it because they were still babes in Christ. Right? They weren't able to handle that teaching. Right? So we increase in godliness, we're going to de decrease in sinfulness, that's growth. Now, sin is time spent in the flesh. And I won't go through all of these for sake of time, but in Galatians 5, we see the difference between the flesh and the spirit. And it gives a list of all different things. And from verse 19 onwards, you can go and read that yourself. But it says all these things, adultery, fornication. So that's sin, spending time in the flesh. But it finishes off with the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Right, so when we talk about time spent in the spirit and the flesh, it's talking about doing these sorts of things. Right? 2 Timothy 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So this life as a Christian, it's not going to be easy. You know, this is why it's saying here, you've got to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So it's not easy to do these things. It's not easy to spiritually grow. So don't expect it to be easy. Salvation is easy but not growing spiritually. Growing spiritually, like I said, it's going to take patience. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take diligence. It's going to take study. It's going to take some endurance. And we've got to be careful of things that will take us away from that. The affairs of this life that we're going to get entangled in, as it says in verse 4, so that we can be that soldier that Jesus Christ has called us to be. Now, this is the last passage I want to go to. This is Hebrews 5. It says here in verse 12, For when for the time... Ye ought to be teachers. Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So you see how there's that thing where if you don't grow as a Christian, right, and you're not walking in the, spiritual, in the spirit, you're going to start going backwards. And this is what Paul is addressing here, where there are people here, when he was talking to in Hebrews, they should have been at the point in their spiritual life where they were teaching others, but they were still needing to be fed with milk. He says, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become as such as of need milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. See that link there? Milk is being unskillful in the word of God. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use, see the more you use God's word, the more you're going to grow, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. All right, so if you want to grow spiritually and have healthy spiritual growth, you need to make sure you're getting plenty of spiritual food. That's the word of God. Make sure you're doing plenty of spiritual work, right? That's preaching the Word of God, whether to unbelievers or to believers, right? And it's going to need time, right? You can't expect to grow just immediately. 
But the more time you spend in the spirit, the more you're going to grow. But beware, because time you spend in the flesh, there's a, there's a gravitational pull, right? Pulling you backwards in the spiritual life. Whereas in the physical life, you're just always growing older. Not so in the spiritual life. Right? And that's why even though you may have been in church for decades and decades, right? if you're not eating and you're not working, it's going to be working against you. You're going to go backwards and become a babe. Okay, so just some closing thoughts. Are you growing spiritually? Are you growing? You know, many of you have been Christians for many years now. You know, when you look back at your spiritual life, are you further along than you are back then? Or are you the sort of Christian that says, yeah, we're back in the glory days, back in the day when I was serving, back in uni, back when I was, back when I was younger. You know what that means? That means that you've grown, you're younger in the spiritual life. And that's not a good thing. Are you growing? Do you know more than you used to? Do you do more than you used to? You know, are you more spiritually mature than you used to be? This is the question I want you to ask yourself today. If you're not growing, what area are you lacking in? You know, are you lacking in food? Are you lacking in work? Are you lacking in time? Right, and the consistency. So make a decision today to do something different. You know, don't leave the church today the same person that you came. You know, make the decision today and say, you know what? I'm, I'm not growing, you know, or yeah, I'm, I'm growing, but I want to be growing more. And make that decision today and say, you know what, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to change my spiritual diet, my spiritual re uh, regime, and I'm going to start growing for the Lord. Because if you do, like it said in, in 1 Peter, right, you're not going to be unbarren, uh, barren and unfruitful. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the reminder for us to grow in our spiritual life. Sometimes we get comfortable, Lord, in the Christian life and, uh, you know, we, we, we mistake that comfort for spirituality and we start backsliding in our Christian life. Lord, I pray that each one of us here uh, will, will reflect on their spiritual life and, Lord, help us to grow. Help us to make the decision today, Lord, you know, I want to grow. I'm going to do something different from today onwards. So we thank you, Lord, for, the, for Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the grace that you've given us that enables us to change the new creature in us. I pray, Lord, that we would spend as much time as possible in the spirit rather than the flesh. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.